Hi, my name is Alan Brow, and I'm the Vice President of IoT and Embedded Solutions at Sectigo, and this is another in our series of videos on IoT security topics. And in today's video, we're talking about Secure Boot for IoT devices. And Secure Boot is really a critical capability, and there's a few concepts that we should talk about before we get into the, to this a little bit further. And the first is that Secure Boot is a capability that has to be built into the device at a very low level. You know, this isn't something that can be added by a user after, after it's designed. It's something that has to be built in by the OEM. And it's, it enables validation of the code on the device so that all the firmware and software on the device can be verified as being known and trusted. And again, this provides a very critical capability. And this brings up the question of a root of trust, which is just a starting point that is known to be good and can be trusted. There's a number of ways that that can be implemented, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Another important concept is provisioning, which is just the method of programming the device with those security artifacts needed to enable secure boot. So how do you, in addition to programming firmware on the device, how do you program the device with the security keys and the signatures needed for secure boot? And then finally, in the IoT world, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Everything that, you know, all, there's a wide, wide range of IoT devices from very, very low resource sensors, you know, with not very much memory, very limited processing power, up to very high-end devices, you know, the processing inside of an MRI machine, for example, is an embedded device, but it has a tremendous amount of processing capability. So Secure Boot SDK, which is what, um, you know, what's used to implement Secure Boot, has to be very flexible. So if we pay attention to um, the headlines in you know, the kind of the common IoT press, we'll see that there's a wide range of attacks against IoT devices, many of which are successful because they're able to reprogram the firmware on the device. And you know, these are all attacks that we've seen, and there have been many more recent attacks where hackers were able to successfully either insert malicious code onto a device or modify the code on the device. Now this is not a this is a multi-step process. Hackers start by finding a security flaw that allows them to exploit a device. So they're able to launch a successful attack into the device to get some control on the, over the device. Once that's done, they can download their code to the device and install it on the device. At that point, they have control of the device. In some cases, the malicious code then just goes off and does its thing. It's pre-programmed to perform some action. And you know, once installed, it's off and running. In other cases, it just sits there and waits and listens. And these are the attacks that I think are actually a little bit more scary because they can lie dormant for days, weeks, months, even years with no one knowing that the device is infected. But once it receives a command, it will go perform that malicious action that it's instructed to do. So as we look at this, this brings up the question of trust. And we're talking about how do we trust the code running on your IoT device? Rather than just you know, blindly trust the code, we need a way to actually verify that the code running on the IoT device hasn't been tampered with. And that's what Secure Boot is all about. And on top of Secure Boot, Secure Firmware Update extends that capability to allow an OEM or manufacturer to securely update the code, again, while maintaining known, good, trusted code on the device. And if we're able to do this, we can eliminate a huge set of vulnerabilities. The problem is many IoT devices are designed to just run whatever software is loaded. And the boot sequence executes, it jumps to a location memory, and off it goes. Furthermore, many IoT devices are extensible. They need to be able to support downloading user apps onto the device. If you think about a DVR, a set-top box, an infotainment system in the car, all of those support installing and running third-party apps. And while that's an important feature or capability, it opens up the prospect of having malicious firmware downloaded to the device, and, and just it opens a window of vulnerabilities there that has to be very carefully controlled. And again, many IoT devices weren't built with this in mind. Secure Boot operates using digital signatures, so code signing and code validation, which is an analogous process to you know, any digital signature. If we look at digital document signing, it's the same signature process and same validation process, just implemented on an embedded device. 
one of the keys is we need to make sure again that we've got that root of trust. You know, how do we know that the code that does the validation is itself trusted? So the root of trust is the anchor. It's a solution or a capability for finding a way to have some set of code that we know is trusted. And again, it can be based upon having a hardware security module such as a TPM that stores the, the security validation keys and the signatures that we know can't be tampered with, along with the boot sequence that, that has some boot code that's immutable storage. And again, so the bootloader itself with the secure boot capability could be implemented in a ROM that's immutable. It could be implemented in, in Flash. It can be locked and not changed. And either way, we have to have some known starting point. Another way of implementing that is with what's called ARMS Trust Zone technology. And ARMS Trust Zone is a, another big topic that's worthy of a video in and of itself. But what it does is it divides the processing world, or the processing space on a single chip within a, an SOC into a trusted world and a normal world. And in the trusted world, only a very small set of known, good, trusted code is allowed to execute. And so the secure boot could be implemented to run inside of the trusted world or the secure world in ARM's trust zone. Either way, once this trusted root of trust code is up and running, it validates the other components and we're off and going. So as I said, secure boot uses code signing or digital signatures applied to code and validation of that. And again, a digital signature allows you to verify that whatever was signed hasn't been changed. So we know if the digital signature is valid, the code hasn't been modified. So the signing process happens offline, would happen on the signing, secure, signing server, which is a server that itself has to be secured. But it will create the, it'll do a, a hash of the image to create a digest. It uses a private key to sign the, the digest, creating that signature. Then on the device, in addition to the code, you program the public key and the signature and the, the secure boot code, which will repeat the process. So it will actually go and calculate the hash of the code to know what the current code is, decrypt the signature using the public key to obtain the computed hash that was computed on the code signing machine, and compare those. Those have to be exactly the same. If they are, we know the code is good. If any of the code has changed, then we know the code isn't good, and the secure boot process has to, at that point, not allow the device to boot and execute. So if we look at how this is done, well, there's a couple of capabilities that are, that are really critical. And when we look at the secure boot toolkit from Sakigo, these are the pieces that are provided. There's the code signing tool itself, the code that, that creates the signature, and the code signing certificate, you know, the, the keys, are used for creating the signature and validating the signature. Those are, are components of the Secure Boot SDK that are provided to OEMs. There's then all the APIs for Secure Boot, the capabilities that allow it to be integrated onto the device itself, so the libraries that are implemented on the device. And then finally, the ability to integrate with various hardware platforms. So there's a porting layer that allows the Secure Boot capability to be moved to really any IoT device's hardware platform. So if we look at the components, again, there's a porting library which provides integration with Flash and other hardware components. There's a certificate library which allows you to utilize certificates, validate the certificate chain so that we know that the certificate used to sign the signature is trusted. And in some implementations, you know, Secure Boot will bypass the certificate piece and just use that public key and have that public key you know, burnt into, um, you know, burnt onto the device into a, a ROM storage on the device. So that's an optional piece that can be pulled out for devices where scalability is an issue, where resources are an issue to, to minimize the footprint. The next piece is the crypto library. Again, we're talking about core crypto op operations, so those have to be included. And again, that can be done in software or hardware. And then there's the secure boot library itself, the validation piece, the login capability, the APIs to enable integration into the device, along with firmware update enablement. So all the APIs to enable firmware update to be layered on top of the secure boot process. So as we look at this, one of the, you know, Sectigo's 
uh, one of the leading providers of IoT security solutions. And these solutions have been under development for the past you know, decade plus and are really, you know, have been deployed on a wide range of IoT devices. So you've got, you know, a solution that you can easily utilize regardless of your platform. And this allows you to standardize on a single solution across all products. So to learn more, you can visit our website or stop back again and look for additional videos as we're producing a number of videos on IoT security topics.